Good evening, everybody. It's Wednesday, it's 6 30, and you know what we do. Welcome to Psychom Chats with Ntigi. My name is Ntigi Saki, and I'm your host for these amazing science communication chats where every single Wednesday we bring you a scientist or a science communicator and we just get to know more about their psychom journey you know we get to know more about why they do psychom you know why do they feel it's so important because i mean already if you're in academia or if you're a scientist you expect it to publish and you know add more knowledge um to the to the current existing body of knowledge in, in your field you know um but why then do you feel that you need to now take your science and package it in such a way that anybody who's anybody can understand it and can engage with it. Why would you want to put yourself out there, you know, and open yourself up to people's criticisms, people's questions, or, or whatever it is regarding your work? Why do you do it? And that is why we chat to all of these different scientists and we just want to get to know why they do what they're doing, what it's all about, and yeah, you know, and um, the inspiration behind that. And today, we have another scientist. She is somebody who's been doing Psycom for a long time. Um, you know, she was actually doing Psycom before it really became um, a really serious thing where even some, I know like with some funding places, you cannot you know, just go ahead and do funding or have their funding without actually communicating your science. But she's been doing it for a very long time and it's something that she's really been enjoying doing. So today we're going to chat with Colisa and we're just going to ask her about her journey and why she does it. And obviously we'll, we'll ask her about Nitro, you know, I mean, why not? So let's bring her in and get this conversation started. Thank you for her to join us. And then we're going to get this conversation started and just talk about everything that's everything <laughs> regarding Psycom. Anyway, welcome to Psycom Chats. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how are you feeling? Are you feeling excited? You seem very calm and relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just... Well, <laughs> well, I was feeling calm and relaxed. Um, but when I started having to go online the anxiety and the um i could say the nerves came through but i'm okay i'm looking forward to this chat and i hope we have a, a great conversation i hope to have a lot of people learn from my experiences um and just change someone's life I can see that happening for sure. So we're going to dive right in and kind of get to know you. So for somebody who's never met you, who's never heard of you before, um, and they want to know who Kolisa is, what do you say? Who are you? Who is she? Well, I am a, I'm a happy chappy. Um, I'm a... A girl from Tata. I was born in the rural town. Tata people would decapitate me for saying it's a rural town, but it is. <laughs> so I come from Tata in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. And um, I am a, have um, educated myself to become a scientist. Okay, let me give credit to my parents as well, who educated me at some point. But um, I took over and I decided to, um, to lend myself to where I am today, um, which is being an ocean scientist, um, one of the rarest um, careers for black women, especially um, black women in my country. So um, I'm a black woman scientist. I'm a, um, uh, some people would, would refer to me as an oceanographer. I'm a marine biogeochemist, but I'm also a science communicator. Um, I'm a very well-known science communicator globally. Um, I talk about um, science, my science, other people's science, the impact of science in society, and why science um, is so important. I mean, the research we do, we don't just do for ourselves. 
we do to change lives, we do to improve um, the planet, we do to understand how the, um, the planet works and how we can improve um, the planet for future generations. So that's who I am. Um, so overall, I could just say I'm a, I'm a very bubbly, non-conventional researcher. I like that. I like that. So there's a lot that you said in there that I, that I can't wait to ask you about. But one thing I don't want to forget, I don't want to forget this question because I was like, I have to ask you this. So a little bit of background. At some point, this is probably like a fun fact, but at some point in my life, I wrote down that I wanted to be a marine biologist. <clears throat> and obviously I'm not that, and I'm probably not going to be that <laughs> anytime soon. But um, I wanted to be a marine biologist, and I was like, I need to learn how to scuba dive, you know, because yeah. I want to see everything. So here's the question. Do you know how to scuba dive? Not yet. Um, I don't know how to dive yet. But I was supposed to start diving last year and uh, COVID-19 complications messed up our plans. So this year I, I have to start with that. But the reason why I don't necessarily need to, um, to dive is because the science that I do um, doesn't require me to do diving. Um, I always get asked this question, mm. do you dive? <laughs> um, does you dive? Like when you go fetch your samples from the ocean, don't you have to go in the ocean? And I'm like, not really. We we actually use machines. Um, we use a, a very expensive machine called a CTD, a CTD rosette, where we have all these uh, bottles that we throw into the water. And those are the bottles that do the, the sampling for us. So we don't have to dive into the water. Actually, if you watch my CNN um, episode on um, CNN Africa, Inside Africa, um, you will see how we do it. But then the episodes only show how we do it by hand. Mm -hmm. So there are other ways of doing it. For example, when I go to sample for, um, say for my PhD, for example, have to hop on board the, the research vessel, the South African research vessel called the NCI Gallus 2. And um, on board there, the, the CTD, the actual big machine is there and it's dropped into the ocean. It was CTD, International CTD Day a few days ago and I did share what it looks like on my Instagram and mm -hmm. all my other uh, social media accounts. So if anyone's interested to see how it looks you can just page through and you'll find it there so we just throw that in uh, so the diving however is very important because there was a time when uh, National Geographic um, wanted to have me work as, as their explorer however because I can't dive um, I, I did not um, have a um, um, a straight up plan of what I'll be doing because the work that they do includes a lot of going under the water and uh, trying to understand how um, the world there works, how the, um, the biology, um, the physics, the chemistry works, but you have to actually be under the water because even the viewers themselves are very fascinated by that part of, um, of the documenting, the especially in my case, I would be one of the few black people who are under the water. So it's something I really have to do. Um, and I applaud you for asking me that question. <laughs> cool. Now I was really curious, you know, um, and it seems like a lot of fun, like your job or the field that you're in at the moment seems like a lot of fun. What do you find most satisfying about the field that you're in? Well, um, the field that I'm in is extremely fun, <laughs> um, but the hard part is that the data analysis um, and the writing of the, the papers, when like the hardcore science, when you have to do the hardcore science, that's the, the intricate um, and very challenging part of my job. However, 
um, what I find most satisfying about it is um, the fact that I can go around talking about it. Not a lot of people talk about it. Not a lot of people are, are in this field, especially in Africa. So um, the most satisfying is talking about the work, educating others, um, being part of all these documentaries, being part of um, all these science communication um, uh, structures. It, it, however, that has its, um, its disadvantages because everyone wants you. Everyone wants to talk to you. Everyone wants to hear what you're doing. And so it somehow uh, takes away from, um, because I'm a PhD candidate and I have to complete my PhD, right? Mm. So it kind of takes time away from, from the, the focus of my actual work, which is having to submit, right? <laughs> so because I have to talk to all these um, um um, these journalists, I have to talk to these producers, I have to like, I'm all over the place if, if you look me up you will find everything that I do and I have done, I started doing this, all this stuff during my PhD and a PhD is in my field is between five and six years, so all that work um, has been done within just this time so it's very satisfying. However, it's also very demanding. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know, last week we were speaking to Aviwe, and um, you know, she was talking about the <coughs> challenge of time when you put yourself out there as a science communicator. That it it can be so difficult to kind of juggle all of this because you're trying, like you say, you're trying to <laughs> finish. You know, within the five years or six years, you don't want to be doing your PhD for the next 10 years, you know, or anything like that. Uh. <laughs> you know, you want to try and finish all of this, but at the same time, you want to make time for your science communication. And it's just a lot. So how do you handle it? Like, how do you try and juggle everything? Because I know time is a serious challenge. Um, so in postgrad studies, Time management is one of the key um, skills that you need to have. And you time manage yourself. You time manage the work that you're doing. You time manage your interactions with others. So the science communication work is something added on top of all that. And some of it, or rather most of it, is, is paid work. So it's like you are doing this... Um, this degree, but you're also making an impact and getting paid for, for doing the work that you're doing on the outside, especially international projects. International projects will pay you, um, like they will um, compensate you for your time. Um, if you work with the US, if you work with the UK, for example, they will pay you for, for, for being there, for um, taking time away from your PhD because they understand. However, when it comes to South Africa, um, it could be a tricky one because it's like maybe South Africans don't understand that you have your own work that you're doing and you need to make time for them. You need, for example, I can't just come and just talk unless it's just a, a, um, a chat. I have to prepare for it yes. because also there are people who are linked to the work that I'm doing. So I can't be out there and embarrassing myself and everyone who's linked to the work that I'm doing. So um, there are industries and entities that do not understand that. So this comes back to how you manage your time. So you have to be very specific and very intentional about who you allow to, um, to use your time to be able to borrow the time from you and go out there and uh, speak about the work that you're doing with them or whatever it is that they would like you to, um, to link the work that you're doing uh, to. For, I'll make an example. For example, um, in 2019, I was asked by the uh, energy industry to go speak as a moon speaker in, in Johannesburg. And of course, I would be away from my work for four days 
um, when I say away from my work, I mean away from the office. And this was before COVID when people uh, understood when you are not in the office and you could work from elsewhere. And so when they approached me, it was not about um, the industry that I'm in. However, the work that I'm doing is also linked to the energy industry. So it was about that, um, that um, multidisciplinary relationship. But they understood that they are taking me away from the work that I'm doing. And so it had to be a negotiation between myself, my supervisor, and them. So my supervisor won't speak with them, but I have to speak with her about the time. You know, um, so time management is a very important part of the the entire cycle, the the entire equation, and you need to be very strategic in how you you work around that because. When I went there, I had to make time for uh, preparing to speak, speaking, engaging with um, all those um, um, professionals that I had to talk to. And then there'll be more people who will invite you to come speak. But then I also had to make time for after the speaking to go have a beer or so mm -hmm. and work. You know, you, you have to make time to, to do the work, to to give some time for your PhD. Do not neglect um, the actual work that you are doing um, with the research, the, 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 the one that pays you. Mm -hmm. You should always put in the middle. Mm -hmm. And everything else, you just rush in the time. So that's how I do it. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's working for me, but so far, <laughs> so far I is. think it probably <laughs> It probably is. <laughs> no, no, no. That's yeah. good. I think you gave a really in-depth, um, um, yeah, in-depth insight into how time management works, you know, and how you can, mm -hmm. you know, kind of work around the whole thing and how you have to negotiate your time. I really um, I like the yes. fact that you're like being conscious of it, you know, because sometimes when um, you're enjoying something, before you know it, it's two hours later. But if you're conscious, you're like, no, I, be, I said I'm going to be here for 45 minutes and that's it. 45 minutes is done. Yeah. I need to go and now do the next thing. So that's really good. But I want us to backtrack a little bit. How does a girl from rural Mtata <laughs> end up studying oceans? Like, how did that happen? Well, um, so, I mean, <laughs> I, I've never been asked this question the way you asked it, <laughs> but, um, so my undergrad, um, which was at Walter Sulu University, allowed me to double major. So I double majored in zoology and botany and, um, our zoology, and I see there's someone from Musu in in the chat, in the live, sorry. Hi, hi, Nandi. <laughs> so we, in the zoology um, uh, modules, we have a lot of marine biology because zoology um, is about a lot of animal-based work. But for us, it was very marine biology-based. Um, so... I wouldn't say that actually made me want to go into oceans because I kind of didn't like it. Um, I, I, I've, I've never really been a marine biologist um, liker, if I could put it like that. <laughs> you know, I wasn't much into zoology, and that's why I went and majored in the botany because botany was more exciting for me. It had a lot of lab work. Um, it was based on... Um, um, germinating stuff in the lab, you know, creating new things in the laboratory. Um, and then in my honors, I had to work with microbes and um, create something just from microbes, using microbes, you know. So that for me was more exciting than this uh, um, zoology that was marine-based. However, when I reached my master's, um, so I, I, I changed from 
Walchester Univers University to UCT in my master's. Mm -hmm. So in my master's for, uh, with UCT, I studied um, microbes again. So microbes are these um, microscopic organisms that you cannot see with the naked eye. And the ones that I was studying were, um, were called soil microbes. So they have an association with the soil. So they do all these things. They, um, they have all these fascinating traits um, and everything that they do is made to be successful because of the association they have with, with the soil because they get nutrients from the soil and they get their powers, if I could say, <laughs> from um, the association with the soil. So when I worked with them and I analyzed their DNA and got to see that, oh my gosh, I don't have to see it with the naked eye, but it basically rules what I do. It, it, it kind of, it's like the gist of everything that we do. Our plants depend on it. Um, uh, the planet, uh, a fraction of the planet depends on it. I was like, okay, so now I want to understand how these work in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to change the environment because this was terrestrial. It was soil. Now I wanted to know how it works in the water. And so that's how I ended up uh, studying the ones in the water, um, which are phytoplankton in this case. So now these are not uh, bacteria. These are now like, um, they call them the plants of the ocean. And they, they really are the, the, the basic, I know the basic unit of life is the cell, but they are based, the basic units of life in the water. Um, and without the, these phytoplankton, there's no planet. The planet dies because everything depends. They are the primary producers. Everything depends on their success. So that's how I ended up, um, being this water associate, the ocean chick, mm. as they call me. And I could say, I don't know, it was like a, a calling of some sort. <laughs> okay, that's, that's an interesting journey. Like it was, it was not straightforward as you'd expect it to be. No, <laughs> it was not straightforward at all. So you mentioned something about powers. <laughs> Speaking of powers, I want to talk about I your superpower. <laughs> you know where I'm going. <laughs> yeah. I want to talk about Nitro, the super scientist. Like, when you found out that you are going to be represented as a superhero or a superheroine in this case, <laughs> what went through your mind? you know, when that came to the table? I actually had to be convinced to be, to become Nitro. I didn't just agree. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why, why, was it, why was it a matter of people needed to convince you? Um, it was Justin who had to convince me, the founder of Super Scientist, mm -hmm. Dr. Justin Yarrow. Mm -hmm. uh, so Justin, uh, this one day, just out of the blue, sent me a message on um, on my Twitter and I was like okay he wanted to chat he was like um, from super scientist blah 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 I'm like okay uh, okay what's that <laughs> I didn't know what it was at the time yeah. and then uh, we had a, a chat he called me I was in the in my office at the University of Cape Town in the oceanography department so I had to leave my office because there were people in the office and I went to sit in the library, which is usually empty. So I sat there and had a, a chat for like an hour and a half. And in this hour and a half, he tells me what super scientist is all about. And I'm like, do I actually want to do that? I, I don't know if it's in line with my work. Um, mm. I don't know if it's in line with my brand. It's in line with because I know there are people who don't um, subscribe to being brands, but I believe that we're all brands. Of and <laughs> I, 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 was, I was saying to myself when he pitched this to me that, is my brand Kolisa the oceanographer? Like, does she want to be? 
this this nitro well we didn't have a name at the time <laughs> so she wanted to be this super scientist for kids and i was like kids oh my gosh i would have to deal with kids <laughs> and for me that was that was a bit tricky i was like uh well i don't know justin <laughs> but let's let's see how it goes let's think about it and then i said to him okay if i do this here's what i want this um the skull to look like so i designed my suit uh i told him what i want nitro to be carrying and how i want nitro to use her superpowers and justin says to me this is the first time we have a person who tells us what to do <laughs> <laughs> and i was like well i guess that's a good sign right <laughs> it it kind of means that i'm you involved in this yeah okay he came back to me and he showed me nitro um and the suit and everything i was blown away i'm like whoa okay let's call her uh what did i iso iso hydro hydro iso something because i work in the ocean hydro um and isotopes i work with isotopes to to um understand um what is happening in the ocean so that's why i chose that name and just was like uh -huh. that's that's not catchy let's go with nitro because you're always working i don't know when you sleep but you're, you're always working you're everywhere like if i look here call us nyanya call us nyanya ocean don't 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 like let's just call you nitro you know those cars with the nitrous oxide when they take off you are that so let's let's call you that i was like okay <laughs> <laughs> you it's your it's your stuff let's go with it mm -hmm. and then nitro was um uh introduced formulated and put out there and war the the response was insane i mean justin has had uh super scientists before nitro but it was like okay they're super scientists but then when nitro arrived it just changed the entire trajectory um and that's when he see i think that's when he also saw that no man super scientist is is insane cha mm. it's going to go places and he started introducing more um more of the south african based scientists who are in the media because i think the reason why nitro uh, blew up so quickly and so um took a like a um a skyrocketing trajectory is because Collis was already in the media you know so that that helped a lot so now i'm seeing that that's what his um his angle is mostly about having these uh scientists who are already established in um in public and using that to to push the initiative to push the agenda yeah. and he's doing amazing like he's doing an amazing job in december i met i met a kid who is a nitro fan and wanted to meet the person behind nitro i got there and i was crying like crazy you in front of people dealing with kids <laughs> i was crying like i was crying in the car before i got there and then when i saw the kid and the kid got excited when i was like nitro Dr. Kanisa I'm like oh my god and the tears just fell and her entire family was there her granny her granny's friends her her friends it, it was just everyone there and we had a a lovely meeting they gave me a christmas gift oh my gosh I'm going to cry now. <laughs> oh, thank you. so that's what nitro does oh. um nitro has changed so many lives I know the other super scientists are doing that as well but right now we're talking about nitro yeah. but the, the super scientists um initiative wow I don't think Justin thought it would um do what it's doing yeah. so occasionally he'll send me boxes and boxes of activity books and um trading cards and one of them you can see um is on my computer here mm -hmm. and i will just as soon as i get them the people who are like can i have this for my kid can i have this it it i it it has reached beyond what it was aimed to do i believe 
and it has become international. We've been featured in Science Magazine, us, Science Magazine. Well, okay. <laughs> featured for super scientists, not the research that we do. <laughs> now imagine that. Exactly. So, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm really, really excited to be Nitro. I'm proud to be Nitro. And I'm so glad I agreed to, to, to be part of it, to be part of the Super Scientist um, franchise. Yeah. I wanted to grow. Uh, last week, he sent me a, a picture. They have given Nitro legs. So Nitro uh, was just the upper body the whole time. <laughs> and I'm sure, no, I'm sure nobody even uh, realized it because when... He sent me the picture of Nitro with legs. I was like, Nitro didn't have legs? <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> I but, yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, no, that's, that's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> it's so beautiful to see um, the impact that it's having because that right there is science communication in itself, you know, because yeah. I think... Um, we've all just thought that science communication is communicating your research. No, it's also communicating what, what a science looks like, yes. you know? And I mean, yes. on those trading cards, it says, this is Nitro, this is what they do. This is, already it's like, oh, okay, so this is what they do. This, this is a, like a career that exists. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. Yeah. And so it, it really is science communication at its base. Like, I'm looking at the time and I can't believe it's been over 30 minutes already. And I'm like, I haven't even gone through all my questions, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to ask you two more questions. And then that's it because I really do um, value and respect your time. So, <laughs> so the question, oh my gosh, now I've literally been really lost my train of thought because I just got so excited about everything. Um, <laughs> but You've been doing science communication for a very long time, especially on Twitter. Um, you've been doing it for a very long time, even before, um, you know, it really became a requirement. I know for some funding institutions, it's a requirement. If you don't communicate your science, then you haven't fulfilled <laughs> one of their requirements. Um, why did you decide at that time? Because it's like all the way back to when you were doing your honors around that time, that's when you started. Why did you decide, I need people to know about my work? Like, you could have just stayed and, you know, did the normal publications, articles and stuff. Why were you like, nope, public. Why? Wow, uh, that's so interesting. You went and, <laughs> and saw that. I started back then. Wow. Um, yes, you really did great research there. Okay. <laughs> So I started science communication because it was fun for me. Um, I, I didn't really have um, a reason back then. I was just like, a lot of people don't know what I'm doing. Let me just tell them what this is about, uh, why I'm growing these, these, um, these bacteria on a plate, what this plate is, what it's about, what, uh, what's the media, what's medium, on, first of all. Um, like the nitty gritties of the the science that we the the science material that we work with, because I mean a lot of people are not scientists. Even the scientists that do science don't do the science that I do. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of people out there, and when it, it, it when it comes to research you do individual research. So there are a lot of people out there who don't know what you're doing, who don't understand how you're doing what you're doing. So talking about it for me was fun. I mean, um, I've always wanted to be a scientist. So being a scientist for me is like, it's, it's like waking up every day and just being me. Yeah, well, so... When I started back then in my honors, it was just about talking about the work that I do, just do it for fun. Um, and also social media was new to me. So it was an exciting thing to do, to just go on social media and be like, oh my gosh, the plates, the contamination, the don't go, you know. But then um, when I reached my master's, I, I started seeing that, oh my goodness. So... There are people who actually see what I wrote 
and they want to come and do what I'm doing. They, um, they want to change their careers, for example, or they want to change their topics and come do the topic that I'm doing. So I was like, oh, so it's doing something, this um, talking about the work that I'm doing. And to be honest with you, back then, I didn't understand the magnitude of um, the impact. Uh, so it was just acknowledging that, okay, it, it has done something somewhere. And that continued. And when I reached my PhD, now it was a, an even crazier field. Because when I was doing my master's, I used to always get told, even in my department, that you are the first black South African woman in this department that we are seeing doing this. I remember there was a, a technician in the department. His name was Francois. We're still good friends. And Francois even today still says this, that he had never seen a black woman in the department. It was a first and this black woman didn't care a damn about who is looking, why they are looking. She does what she's doing and she struts her stuff. So apparently I'm like that. <laughs> So he admired that. And so not just in science communication, but even in real life, there were people who were looking and who were observing, right? And so that was very inspiring um, for me. And when I got to the field that um, was so rare for, for people like myself, for black people, number one, number two, women, black women, um, it just like nitro kind of blew up. So when I first registered and started talking about what I'm studying, that I'm Kholisa Snyanya studying uh, oceanography in the oceanography department at the University of Cape Town, I'd get uh, reporters from, say maybe from the UK, they're like, can we chat? Uh, can you tell me about your work? When are you publishing? I'm like, I just started last week. What do you mean when am I publishing? <laughs> Yeah. Like, I, I haven't even gone to the fields to collect data. Mm. You know, I, I only started collecting data uh, later in my PhD yeah. because of, um, you know, UCT had, UCT had that, all that drama with, mm. um, what was it called again? Um, Rose Must Fall yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. So it kind of delayed us. Um, but when I got to PhD, the media was so involved in the work that I was doing that um, I was, I, I thought to myself, okay, maybe I should just make this a work thing and I should charge them to, to talk <laughs> yes, to me. Of course. But I, I should everybody. charge them if they want me to come speak about my work, I should charge them. Mm -hmm. And then I went and did, um, Fame Lab. I entered Fame Lab. Yes. And on Fame Lab, I I came in second. Yeah. I, after that, I just because <laughs> Fame Lab is the biggest science communication yeah. uh, competition in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So after I did Fame Lab, I became this global science communicator who was um, sought after everywhere. When Pint of Science came to South Africa, I was one of the nine contestants in, in, um, in the university that were asked to speak, uh, to speak about my research. Um, and then it just carried on. And I, at, at some point, I, I became a judge for, for Fame Lab. So I was highly associated with, uh, with science communication. And then... In, I think it was 2019, the South African um, Antarctic program asked me to be their science communicator. Like, they wanted to travel with me everywhere they go um, mm -hmm. to, uh, to be the one who will be there and just um, do the SciComm stuff. Um, I'm still not sure how we're going to do that because COVID hit. Yeah. I went to the US to give a talk for my PhD, and when I came back, everything was shut down. So our plans were to start in Australia the next month. So I was, mm -hmm. I was going to go to Australia for, for that SICOM thing yeah. with the South African national Antarctic program, but that never um, took off because of COVID. 
but then my science communication um journey just kind of shifted and it became even more international because everything was done online and they could easily access me and i was um part of i was asked to be part of organizing teams for for global events online mm -hmm. for example um black and geosciences black and marine science which i'm still part of um even now yeah um and and the oxford uh university science communication team um also started working with me so, so my psychom just grew from <laughs> there yeah okay final question final question yeah. and then we've got to end this because we are so over time <laughs> um but final yeah. question you just need to complete the sentence i am a science communicator because i'm a science communicator because i love the impact it has on society i like to be seen um as this black woman who is doing what i'm doing and inspiring more black people and beyond beautiful <laughs> beautiful um i think we'll end it right there thank you so so much this was such a a great chat it went on longer than we expected but i guess it's because like the conversation was just flowing. <laughs> um, and, I, I, and I should have known that as somebody who's a science communicator, you're going to talk quite a bit. <laughs> so 30 minutes is not enough. <laughs> well, I knew that would happen. <laughs> I should have known. I should have known. Um, but I really enjoyed this conversation and I really hope we can have you back on again with something else that we're doing or just have, bring you back on and talk about something else. Um, that would be really, really great. But we really do wish you all the best with everything that you're doing because I know you've got your hands full, which is, yeah. <laughs> you know, but you're doing Thank such you a so great much. job. And yeah, you've got this. You've got this. Um, just remember to take a break when it's time to take a break. <laughs> Don't forget that. Um, but yeah, I wish you all the best. And thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was very lovely and chilled as I expected. <laughs> all right. Have a great <laughs> evening. And thank you so much to everybody for joining this conversation. And yeah, see you next Wednesday. All right. Thank you. Bye. Cheers.